Hello guys, how are you all? Welcome back to my channel. So, today we are gonna see, what if Naruto can summon ghosts? Part 1, subscribe if you enjoy the video, and also support Terra Ace for his fantastic skill, link in description. So let's begin the story. There was, once a village, a village of ninja and civilians that worked together to prosper. For civilization, it was, a free ticket to protection. For the ninja, it was, a central base of operations, to raise and nurture a select few to take on their mantle when they faded away. Eventually, their reasons in forming the village were blurred, and enough time has passed where no one can really recollect why they settled down, other than some outlandish reasons. The story begins in this very village. A village called Konoha, and the story of the young man named Naruto Uzumaki. It was the winter season, and in the middle of January in Konoha village. The local weather ninja predicted that this particular day was to be recorded to be the worst winter day in the history of the usually warm climate village. Granted, they have their share of snow days, but there have been reports that the average temperature had been steadily declining in the last decade. Some have been saying something completely erratic like a lack of faith to a sort of sun deity, despite having no actual evidence that a deity even existed. Like any civilization, there are many diverse opinions. Some believed in something A, and some believed in something B. When ideologies clashed, there were many incidents, forcing Kanoha's ninja forces to step in and act as a police force. Despite their differences, there was one target that they unified against. It was incredible to believe that the one they united against was a small boy. Naruto Uzumaki can easily say that the village did not like him, but he couldn't for the life of him find out why. He wasn't sure, but he would swear that everyone seemed to notice him the moment he stepped out of his apartment and into the merchant district, where most civilians would go for the local markets and equipment shops. One minute everyone was acting normal and happy, and the moment he stepped foot into the edge of the district, everyone would just stare angrily at him. He was used to these stars now, but it was a completely different case when he was younger. When he was four, around the same time he spent the last year huddled with a bunch of orphan children from the Kaiubi attack, he was treated to a particularly rougher confrontation with some half-wit drunk men. He wasn't hurt since their swipes were so clumsy that he could have spat in their face before moving backwards in the time they tried to hit him. Naturally, he wasn't so low that he did that, but the report that summoned him to the Hokage's office told a very different story. He tried to tell his story to the old man, but he was constantly interrupted by the distraught civilian, who was sporting gashes that both the Hokage and the ninja mediating the dispute saw that those injuries could not have been done by a child's nails. Since the victim didn't accuse him of carrying weapons, instead hysterically claiming that he grew big red claws to tear apart his defenseless self, he was sure his case against the boy would succeed. Only his imagination could contain the fantasies of what the brat would get as punishment. He didn't notice three things. The stares that the older Hokage and the ninja around him gave, the obvious flaws in his claims, and the fact that he didn't know how to present a believable case to the highest power in their village. Regardless, he was told that it would get handled properly, and that was somehow enough for him to leave. Afterward, the Hokage asked for his version of what happened, and Naruto told them what he could remember of the night, which involved taking a shortcut that really wasn't back to the orphanage. To the Hokage's recollection however, Naruto wasn't this calm. In fact, he remembered that the usually proud boy was close to crying in fear to the old man when he arrived in his office that day. Rather than reprimanding the boy, he had to find another way to limit these headache-inducing meetings, if he could call them that. It also occurred to him that the more vengeful civilians could have followed him to the orphanage and posed a threat to either the children or the matron taking care of the blonde boy. So the idea came to him why not let him live on his own. A place where he would be looked after by both the people living there and the secrecy of his location known only to Hokage. Since then, Naruto was relocated to the ninja residential district. When Naruto asked why he was being moved there, although he wasn't really complaining, since the kids were real jerks, the old man changed the subject rather quickly and turned the direction of the conversation to a rather friendly Raymond stand that opened up near his new home a few years ago. Naruto, whose mind wasn't as refined, although he would claim differently as a seasoned shinobi, instantly fell for it and started asking the Hokage about the new restaurant. The sudden gust of wind broke Naruto's path of memory lane, although he wasn't as affected as the people around him, shivering even worse than him at some points. Naruto always wondered why these people were wearing so much clothes, but shivering as if they were wearing nothing more than a flimsy shirt. He wasn't particularly dressed for the occasion, but he wasn't as affected as them and he was wearing a simple sweater. Although it might have helped him that he had a knitted scarf at AM, the daughter of the owner of the best shop in the universe, Ichiraku's Raymond, gave him with a kiss on the cheek one birthday afternoon a year back. According to AM, he has never blushed as brightly since then. Naruto still denied that he even turned a hint of red. He even joked about it sometimes, saying loudly that he had a secret fire inside his belly that kept him warm all the time. 
He would get weird and sometimes horrified looks whenever he said that out in the open. He was, enjoying the scarcity of the civilian populace in the main market square today. Not too many glares from the civilians today since it was so cold. He could see the astonishment of some people here and there, as if wondering what god damned them, and blessed him to dress so lightly in the harshest winter of Kanoha history. Today, he was, off to play in the park, since he considered this day to be his special day with no jerks like the local bullies to bother him while playing alone. Yep, it was, going to be terrific. Although, Naruto wondered silently. It was, going to be pretty lonely no one was, there to talk to him, bully him, or even be far away from him. He didn't like the coldness of the people around him, but it was, still nice to have human contact, even if they were nowhere near him. He found that he liked the presence of human life around his young being. As he arrived in the park, he saw that the park was, indeed empty like he thought. The swings were barren, and the sand was, mixed in with the snow, making it some sort of grainy slush. He also spied another makeshift swing on a tree a little ways away from the main equipment. Naruto grinned and swung the lone wooden swing like he always wanted. Standing on it. After a few long swings, he wanted to try something he always wanted to do and began twisting his body and watched how the swing twisted like a tightly wound piece of rope. It was a bit exhilarating how he could act on impulse, without anyone like a bully bothering him or even that overbearing teacher he was, forced to call Sensei 2 at the academy telling him to stop. Naruto frowned, his mind thinking back to a few weeks back. His teacher was pretty vindictive that day and on his birthday of all days. Now that he thought about it, what was wrong with using paint as a distraction to a problem anyways? Even he knew he could use pellets to hold paint and his opponent would be distracted when he threw them. However, his sensei just chewed him out in front of the class and explained that paint wasn't the norm and was less effective than a smoke bomb, which another of the students present helpfully supplied. Naruto frowned at the memory, what did that guy know? He was Naruto Uzumaki and if he wanted to use paint for a technique, then no one would stop him. He was the future Hokage after all. His mental rant cost him his concentration however. He didn't pay attention to how the twisting wasn't in his control and he began unraveling at uncontrolled speeds, making him panic as he tried to steer it back into his control and was failing at it. Sure enough, the force of the unraveling swing promptly threw him off the swing a couple of feet and he landed on his head before his body crumbled from gravity and landed awkwardly onto the floor. As he was, clearing his sore head from snow and dirt, he could have sworn that he was, seeing things. He saw something strange. A young girl was, playing around in the snow a few feet from where he fell. The girl didn't seem to notice him and was, having fun just touching the snow, not noticing her surroundings. Naruto sometimes wished he was, so enthralled by the little things in life like the girl was, doing. He wondered if she wasn't able to get out often or slipped away from her parents. As he was, observing her, something about her confused him. He might have been overthinking it, but he couldn't be sure what the girl looked like. It was as if her looks were not registering in his memory somehow, but he was able to remember people just fine, like A.M. or the old man. Then he remembered how some of the children told the other children, with him listening in, that this area was haunted by spirits of the dead. One of which was a little girl who always played in Snow White. He turned to the girl, who was now alert of her surroundings and watching the skies with a mixture of intensity and alarm. Could that girl possibly be? Naruto paled in fear, having never told anyone that he was afraid of those ghost stories. Was this the girl from one of the stories? A ghost girl? Almost on cue, the girl turned to him and was astonished. Naruto was equally surprised, and it didn't take long for his paranoia of the supernatural to take effect. He suddenly scrambled out of the area, trying very hard not to admit that he both feared the girl and that his bladder had decided to give up and it took his will to hold it in. If he looked back however, the girl had her arm raised toward him and was looking sad that he ran away. She then faded away, feeling rejected at the boy's departure. It was a somewhat slow day in the Hokage Tower, and the Hokage, here is in Siratobi, wished that the mechanics of the tower followed suit. Alas, it wasn't to be the paperwork kept coming, and he sometimes didn't even know who kept making the infernal things. For example, he was staring at one form that somehow needed his signature on he peered closer in disbelief. He expected to sign off on mandatory itcha itcha volumes included as standard gear for Jounins. He paused, maybe that wasn't such a bad idea no. No. Rejecting it, he moved on to the next form. A request to include pocky bars as standard rations. Confused, he looked at the date and wondered how long that thing was, in the process stage and was, startled three years ago. He sighed in frustration and in resignation. He really shouldn't have gotten this job back. Day in and day out he had to sign this, initial that, it never ended. It did have a bright side to it though. Sometimes when Naruto came in on official BUSINESS read. Being caught, he was granted a brief respite from signing those damnable forms, and he had a chance to talk to Naruto and question his well-being sometimes. 
When Naruto just came in for the hell of it, he was also given a well-deserved break, read abandoned paperwork and had time to talk to the energetic lad. Something felt off though, and Hiruzen had an inkling why. He had a full fire roaring in the fireplace, and he found it odd that it was cold somehow. Maybe it was in his mind, but he felt that without Naruto, it felt colder somehow. Speaking of Naruto, where was the boy? Usually, his locator crystal on his bookshelf would tell him where he was at all times, but he didn't like to use it for preserving the chakra stored in the artifact. It was originally the first Tokage's prized possession, and he liked to think it was a privilege to care for and to keep it functional as a duty to the first leader of this village. Still, that didn't mean he wouldn't use it to keep track of his favorite hellion, would it? Grabbing the crystal from the middle shelf, Hiruzen settled it in front of him and closed his eyes for a moment as he gathered up his chakra to power the artifact. He then thought about Naruto in order to locate him through the crystal. Of all the emotions he expected Naruto to have when he peered into the crystal, it certainly wasn't distress. He was surprised to see Naruto in the forested area of the Hokage Monument. He usually was in the park around this time of the day, but he understood that it was so lonely today because of the fierce storm outside. He frowned, however, at the panicked look that the boy sported suddenly before he started dashing toward the monument. He looked toward the area where the boy was supposed to be, and nothing strange was happening in terms of chakra however, he didn't rule out that some idiot villager was out to get him in some romanticized quest of revenge and honor. Of course, it could be nothing and the boy was play-acting, but, to be sure, he called his on-site intelligence officer within the Anbu ranks. After a few words with him, the officer concluded that no foreign chakra was detected by the agents in the field. Confounded, he dismissed the officer and continued to watch the fleeing boy before he lost the image on his chakra orb. He tried increasing the chakra input on the crystal, but the image of the boy he agreed to think of his grandson wouldn't appear again. He called for the Anbu squad in the area and ordered them to watch over the boy through the on-site Anbu officer. He could only pray that his successor's legacy was safe and sound. Naruto was officially freaked out. He was so sure that he was seeing things, at least it was what he told himself that repeatedly. There was no way that a blob of green whatever was chasing him all over the forest while spewing drawn-out sounds that seemed to be words at him. There was no damn way. He looked back and grimaced at the thought that the thing was awfully quick for having no bone structure, and how was that thing still talking to him? The gelatinous thing was still chasing him. He was also saying phrases like SSSTTTU. I wanted to talk. And Kuumhiri. I want to see what you taste like. Naruto scoffed, he wasn't stopping for anyone, especially not that thing. Naruto groaned as the thing still chased him, and he cursed the teacher for being lax in teaching them how to use weapons. He really could have used some kunai training right about now. After dashing through numerous trees and going in zigzagging patterns through them, Naruto was sure that he eluded that whatever the hell that thingy was. Pausing, he took a breath of fresh air into his lungs. It was surely sweet to inhale that wonderful chemical in the air, not that he knew what a chemical was, but he was tired, so he didn't care. He was about to take another gulp when something sounded above him, and it didn't feel natural. Another rustle from the tree line above put him on instant alert when he heard another rustle that was eerily close. A growl and a line of drool landing on his shoulder was all it took to give him a pale complexion. Dreading the outcome and mentally kicking himself for such a reflex move, Naruto looked up and groaned. The humanoid-looking thing was looking at him hungrily, licking his lips in anticipation. He seemed monster-like, with pointed ears and red eyes that were shifting from normal rounder eyes to slit-like her eyes. Suddenly, the monster roared and lunged at Naruto. Oh, you have got to be kidding me. Naruto said loudly and bolted from his resting spot. Once again, he took off running into the woods, the demonic monster behind him. Not noticing that he was climbing higher and higher, Naruto briefly wondered whether or not he should work out more when he started to get winded from the lack of air. He wasn't like this whenever he climbed the monument, and that was pretty high. Wherever this was, he wasn't on Kanoha territory anymore. He had no time to think about it though, that crazy monster was still after him. Dashing through the rocky path in the unfamiliar area, Naruto was suddenly pulled up by the collar of his shirt by a surprisingly strong slender arm onto a higher path. Confused, but relieved at the same time, Naruto saw the monster-like thing looking for him, before rounding the corner of the path he was on. He turned to see his savior only to stare in confusion as he saw a young teenage woman with black hair, he could tell that the girl was a teenager due to the her height. A kimono was covering her back, and her hair was wet, so Naruto concluded that she must have been taking a bath or something when she saw him. Are you alright? The girl asked, her eyes looking playful. If Naruto didn't know any better, he would say that she was ogling him. Naruto nodded, it was only polite to respond to his savior. The girl giggled and helped him stand, and Naruto could only nod dumbly as she did so. 
Her words at this point should have been a warning sign, but his thought process was muddled somehow. Naruto didn't seem to mind that too much though. MMM I haven't had it in a long, long time I like him young. The girl giggled and started to lure him to a secluded area. Naruto's instincts were dulled as he followed her. It was almost as if she had him under a spell. A spell that he wouldn't mind being under forever though, although he couldn't reason why that was, though. Soon after, he lazily noticed where he was being led to. At first, he thought it was some sort of house, but the girl was leading him to a cavern of all places. It was weird, Naruto thought, but it didn't matter to him at all. The girl smiled as she led him to bed of sorts within the cavern. It really did seem that this was her home, Naruto thought as his glazed over eyes were roaming over the girl's body. Something that delighted the girl to no end. MMM I just love being appreciated. Now hold still I am going to make you a man soon enough the girl removed her kimono, and that almost sounded the red alert alarms in his head if his brain wasn't somewhere else at the moment. When the girl removed the robe, two wings sprouted almost magically from her back. Naruto was sure that those wings weren't supposed to be there, and somehow, he noticed, the black hair on the girl's head seemed to gloss over, making it even darker if that was possible. The girl had a thoughtful frown while all of this was going on, as if she was perplexed about something. It's strange though, I didn't even make an effort to be visible, I don't think I ever had to snag something this easy, before he the girl giggled and straddled the boy. With a sultry smile, she began to remove her top so agonizingly slow for Naruto, even though he didn't know why. Just before she was to remove the her full true self, she kicked off from Naruto roughly, all the while snarling in an unladylike manner. During the process, Naruto's senses woke up from the spell she put him under, and his mind was racing to comprehend what the hell had just happened. He was trying to find out why he found himself in a strange place far from the cliff he entered this strange world from Kanoha. The last he could remember was that something pulled him out of the way, and that was it. When he looked around his new surroundings, he gazed upon the debacle that was making so much noise. Suffice to say, it wasn't what you saw every day. The tiny girl in a blue bodysuit with wings that were much smaller than the larger, more imposing winged girl was facing off against a bigger girl in the fiercest glare match he hadn't seen since Ino and Sakura's fight a few weeks back. The fight which broke their friendship was all about the pettiest thing if he could recall correctly ah, that was it. He recalled it was about that one boy Sasuke Chan. A noise much like the unsheathing of the sword caused him to turn away from that stray thought. Naruto watched on with interest as the larger girl swiped at the tiny girl with enlarged nails, something that he didn't notice before. How dare you ruin my plaything. You pixies always do this. The winged girl growled out. The tiny girl, a pixie, smiled mischievously. To Naruto, he believed that he was seeing Ino and Sakura all over again. Only in different sizes and voices. Tee hee hee. Now, we can't have our sacrifice be defiled by your schemes. The pixie laughed haughtily at the fuming girl, while Naruto got a feeling of depression. For a minute there, he thought he was saved. But of course, he was slated to be a sacrifice. During his thoughts, the two women, he supposed they were that, started to speak in weird chants and gathered some intense light in their hands, before calling out some sort of weird dot. The resulting power of these was something he had never seen before, at least not anything ninja were willing to use in front of him. The intensity of these jutsu made his eyes water and also widened comically as the tiny girl was going head to head in raw power against a bigger girl. With each caster throw, each jutsu was either being deflected, cancelled with a jutsu of equal power, or just being dodged. After a display of pure power from this fight, an unknown sense alerted him to another presence. His eyes traveled to the exit of the cave that winged girl led him to, and he saw a most peculiar figure, the cat. What got Naruto unnerved that the cat had this subtle aura of confidence that the cat kept showing off while he strutted around the battlefield, looking at the battle between the two demons much like an opponent views a weaker opponent, like an annoyance. Well, that in the fact that the cat was talking to him. Come on, let's leave these demons alone. The cat ordered, as if used to commanding people. Naruto wasn't going to argue with a talking cat who can obviously shrug off the light show the girls were showing off. Picking himself up, Naruto started to follow the cat out of the cave, before a shout of indignation came from behind him. Both the cat and Naruto turned to see the girls glaring at both him and the cat. By the looks on their faces and lack of hostility between them, Naruto figured that they formed a truce in order to capture their target lover's sacrifice. Uo. That cat is interfering again. I won't let them get away. Get them, Lilum. The pixie shouted to the winged girl demon, Lilum. Lilum glared at the impudence of the trash that would dare order her around. You do not order me around. I'll catch him and have my way with him, you lowly pixie. Lilum growled back as she started to charge a yellow light in her hands, before holding it in one hand outstretched toward the duo. Naruto noticed that the cat was tensing up, and he felt wary about how to dodge such a display of power from the girl's hands. Zio. 
Lilam cried before throwing the technique at them like a ball. It missed a few feet in front of them, but the shout of warning from the cat to dodge the ball's direction proved useful as the ball of yellow energy expanded like lightning in a straight line for them. Naruto barely missed the energy from zapping him like a lightning rod by falling on his butt trying to dodge it. After the ball of lightning, Zio, dissipated, the cat spoke to Naruto. You, boy, can you fight? The cat said to the bewildered boy. He knew something about fighting, but it was, mostly improvised brawling. The little I don't know anything professional though he was, cut off by the cat telling him to dodge a green ball of energy thrown near them, that expanded into a mini tornado of sorts. He was, further confounded that the talking cat threw a weapon at him somehow. Use that. It isn't a sword, but it'll help you against these two. Naruto was, confused at the cat's words. He was, no weapons expert or nothing, but this thing that was, thrown at his feet, really did look like a sword. Not wanting to explain, the cat shouted at the boy, feeling a familiar migraine sport on his temple. You'll see what I mean. Now start swinging. The cat ordered as the two demons became fiercer with the sight of the weapon. As soon as Naruto gripped the sword that isn't a sword, he felt something light up within his mind. It was almost as if he unlocked a memory of himself using a weapon such as this, but there was no possible way, was there. The cat that was with him stood silently to the side, it was as he thought. That boy I thought I would never see another one in my time as a dweller in this world. Acting on his new instincts, Naruto rushed toward the startled pixie who didn't expect such a performance with the way the boy was acting earlier. She screamed in pain as the sword turned into an axe made of blue energy and cut her cleanly in two from the mid-waist down. She was, shaking as if her very soul was, self-destructing, but didn't part without any words. No way. There wasn't supposed to be another one of them here. Arg. The tiny girl screamed out as she exploded in a white light, and what looked like blood covered her fading corpse. The Lilum girl didn't look phased by her battle partner's grisly death, and instead started to charge up another Zeo ball to throw at Naruto, who was, deemed too dangerous to seduce by her standards. She wanted it sure, but only from some unsuspecting and defenseless app. The cat spoke up again, this time in warning. Watch out boy, she's going to mutate that Zeo spell into its area counterpart, Mazio. End this quickly, or you're finished. The cat shouted orders to Naruto, who began running toward Lilum. You're through, boy. Mazio. Lilum shouted as she threw the pulsing yellow sphere at Naruto, who caught it fully in the chest. The cat looked away, shaking its head in shame that the boy didn't react in time to dodge the harmful spell. The cat saw how the spell worked out dozens of times. The boy would stand still in shock as the spell fried all of his nerves throughout the body, making for a paralyzed target. The sudden lack of nerve functions would eventually lead to a total body shutdown, making the victim a motionless vegetable. The boy screamed in agony as the spell was taking effect. He was bathed in a yellow light from the spell as it worked its intentions throughout his body until he landed in a heap, his sword dropped by his side. Something felt off to the cat though then his eyes widened in realization. What happened next wasn't to anyone's expectation, especially not to Lilum. Naruto suddenly vanished in a puff of smoke. What? What happened to the boy? Lilum shouted as she scanned the area for the corpse of the boy she was, sure she fried. The cat didn't say anything, but its eyes darted above as he saw something glinting in the dark. Up here, hag. Naruto's boy sounded from above as he brought the sword down on the unsuspecting demon while holding it like an axe. The sword once again glowed with a blue energy in the form of an axe blade as he swung it downwards toward the stunned demon girl. A large gash tore through her mid-upper body and blood sprayed on contact with the magical sword. The girl screamed in agonizing pain as she tried to fly away from the demon swordsman masquerading as a boy in front of her. But it was not to be as the cat shouted something at Naruto, who nodded and stabbed the fleeing demon through the stomach and into the wall behind her. The loud gasp and a crunching sound of bones being stabbed through to the wall was heard. Lilum stared at the sword going through her stomach and the widened eyes of her slayer before laughing weakly at the scene. I guess this is it for me Lilum paused to cough up blood that was sure to drown her before long. Naruto could only stare wide-eyed at the scene and tried to pull the sword out of her, but the cat ordered him not to. Why? The boy shouted at the cat. The cat could only stare at the dying demon as an answer. I was right about you you were going to be such a fine man for my offspring, if I succeeded Lilum took a few desperate gasps of air. Her vision was growing darker with each breath. It looks like this world isn't going to hell after all. If a devil summoner has arisen now shame though. I would have loved to be your demon after all. I honestly thought I could love you. Lilum gasped one last time before exploding in a darker light than her fairy partner, signaling her end of her life. Naruto could only stare in disbelief at her confession and the weight that he had just taken two lives, and he wasn't even a graduate from the academy, yet the pressure made his knees weak and he fell on them, but made no sign that he even knew he did it. The cat stared at the boy with complete neutrality. 
On one hand, this was probably the state the world has come to, since he could see that taking lives for the first time was hard on some people. On the other hand, the last time he checked, this world was currently using children to carry out assassinations when he finished thinking about it, the cat could only do one thing it could do. It worked on his last pupil partner, so it should work on him. He pounced on the boy's arm, raised his paw against it, and scratched the boy's arm in one fell swoop with a sharp claw, drawing blood and a pained hiss from the boy. Now that he had his attention, the cat spoke harshly to the boy. Listen up boy. You must never feel pity for your enemies, ever. They were there to get you, to kill you. If you hadn't done what you had to, you would be raped by that Lilamore offered as a sacrifice to that insane pixie's god. Now, wake up, Baka. The cat started to flinch at Naruto. No matter how sorry he felt for those demon-like creatures, he knew that the cat was right. It was them or him and today he chose himself. That made the pain and shock of killing go away a little, actually. The cat straightened up and climbed aboard Naruto's shoulder and spoke softly into the boy's ear. I haven't seen so much talent with an axe-type sword in a very long while. In fact, the only one who showed this much talent was another apprentice I had back when I was alive. The cat stated and Naruto was startled, was this cat a ghost cat? Be your ghost. Naruto started to freak out badly. He hated ghosts. The cat rolled his eyes and spoke bluntly. Yes, yes, I am a ghost, but the only ghost in this area that saved your life. The cat put pressure on its legs as it prepared to jump off the boy's shoulder. My name is Gaudo, and I am one of the famous overseers to every swordsman who took up the name Raidu Kuzunoha. I was one of the few members of the Itagarasu who survived the Great Destruction nearly a millennium ago and instead lived my natural and supernatural life training other potentially gifted people the way of the sword. The cat, Gaudo, paused before continuing. Very few ever had the privilege of doing combat the way you did against those demons. Most of my apprentices couldn't even see the outline of any demon at all. However, you have a talent that hasn't been seen since the 14th took the mantle of Raidu. I am here to train that talent before it disappears completely from this world. Gaudo paced around the empty cave and started to look around the perimeter of the cave before nodding his head. This will do nicely okay, listen up boy. I have decided for you to train that talent of yours and become the world's newest devil summoner. You will sleep here, eat here, and train here as I cram nearly 1000 years of Yutagarasu knowledge into your head to prepare you into becoming this world's defender. Naruto sputtered as he was, trying to get a word in the cat's declaration of his life. Wawutamanut. I'm training to become a ninja, so that I can become Hokage. He finally shouted out to the planning Gaudo. The cat looked at him weirdly. A ninja. A ninja. A hokage. Has civilization turned back so greatly that it became a folklore fairy tale world. There is no such thing as a real ninja, not anymore. The closest to being ninja assassins are the Tsukagata, and they died off centuries ago. These people are fallacies of ninja, with their flashy jutsu and large explosions of the mag that they call chakra. I will teach you the proper way to use the power that the gods have given you, even though you use chakra rather than mag. Since it's so familiar, we can use the standard lesson plans of the Nameless Shrine's training grounds to train you in your swordplay. How am I gonna get home? Naruto interrupted Gaudo's planning. Gaudo only stared at the boy, he really wanted this hokage title. What goodwill going back to you, boy? You don't seem to be well liked, given those injuries that have healed over your body. Gaudo said as he was, looking over Naruto's body, where his eyes could see various healed wounds and gashes through his clothing. Naruto's eyes widened and looked over his clothing and wondered how could this cat see that? How can you do that? Naruto asked, freaked out by Gaudo's analysis of his physical history. Gaudo scoffed. This is basic stuff I've been doing for decades. I don't even need to use anything advanced to see that a few more hits in certain areas will leave you disabled forever. If you go back now you may never reach your dream of hokage. Gaudo said seriously at Naruto, whose eyes widened at the declaration. Ayu Naruto sputtered as his wild hair covered his eyes. He looked downward as he weighed his options. Gaudo turned and continued his plans for the newest recruit. Good. Now, in order to train F he was, cut off by a fuming Naruto. Screw you, you alley cat. He shouted and effectively shut the cat up. Gaudo was, shocked at his rebellious charge and looked over his words before getting ticked off. Hey. Stop calling me that. I am no alley cat. Gaudo glared at his charge and he glared back just the same. I don't care about anyone telling me what I can't do. If I want to be Hokage, then I'll damn try my hardest. Even if I lose both my arms and legs. Naruto shouted, his dream threatened by Gaudo's sharp words. Gaudo glared harder at the boy, great. He had another idiot for an apprentice that's becoming a fad lately too. I have idiots for apprentices listen up, you baka. I'm not telling you that you can't be Hokage someday, I'm telling you that if you go back now, you are at risk of being passed over for being a Hokage. I am here to teach your hard-headed brain the skills, the techniques and the social skills that come with being a devil summoner. 
Use those skills and you'll become your Hokage dream, if not better. Aldo was about to continue when he felt several presences behind the boy. It looked like his improvised training ground wasn't completely empty after all. Boy, how big is your home? Gaudo asked Naruto, who felt his instincts flare up. It's kinda big why? He asked, looking around and gripping his magical sword. We are going to your home and practicing your skills there, for now we have to retreat. We aren't alone and we are nowhere near skilled enough to beat these demons alone. Gaudo answered as he could see the demons more clearly. They weren't anything stronger than your usual demons here, but they were too tough for his charge for now. Let's go boy, it's too dangerous to fight now. Gaudo said as he went toward the exit. Naruto followed soon afterwards and a few moments later, several demons were looking confusedly at their retreat. One of the demons, a blue cap wearing a thing made of snow, looked at its brother, a pumpkin-faced demon, and said only one thing. Hee ho. Somehow, it was, the work of magic. Naruto concluded as he was, instantly led back to the forests where the Hokage monument was, at. The only thing that was, different was, that he held a magical sword that acted like an axe and a cat that seemed to fade through somehow. So this is Konoha, it sure looks a lot like Tsukagata village. The see-through cat commented before perching on Naruto's shoulder. Naruto was, surprised that the cat could feel just as heavy as a real live cat, even though he was, a ghost. I am in this form because there is little mag energy in this village. No doubt because of this chakra dominance that is over this region. It will be a little tough, but you'll manage to be a decent fighter with time if we train here. Gato paused as he looked in the immediate area for any demon signatures. Boy, you have to make sure that you practice everything I tell you with precision every day. You may go to this ninja academy, but know that my teachings will make you more a ninja than any teacher they will teach you to. You will be sneaky, a professional ninja, like the days of old. We will rest for today. Your combat crash course today should fulfill your day's training. Rest up, for we have a full day tomorrow. Gaudo said as he switched from shoulder to the top of the boy's head. Lead me to your home, boy. We will talk about your new path in life there. Gaudo said from the top of Naruto's head. My name is Naruto, you alley cat. Ow. Naruto growled out as the cat scratched his head sharply. Don't call me alley cat. The hidden Anbu agent could only sweat drop as the boy was, somehow injuring himself in a cat fashion. It was almost as if he had an actual cat scratching him. If there was one thing he dreaded about going to the academy, it was class time with this particular teacher. It could only be described as mind-numbingly boring, Naruto thought as he listened into yet another of his teacher's lessons on ninja history. The man was a bespectacled man who seemed to be just as bored as the students were during the lesson. It wasn't like this though. Naruto remembered that he was so psyched when he saw the ninja academy for the first time five years ago. The first day didn't disappoint either, since they all got a tour of the academy's impressive facilities. It showed older academy students training in all forms of weapons like kunai and ranged weaponry such as bows and shuriken. Then they were told how they were going to be trained in both knowledge and weapons, a lot of the boys, and strangely one girl was, sold on the notion of weapons alone at that point. And how they were going to be respectable figures of society as their defenders. Nowadays he thought that it wasn't at all it was, cracked up to be. Very few days were actually used on the training grounds that the academy owned, and half that precious time was, used on the history of the shinobi. He was up for a little history, as Gaudo sensei his cat's wordplay teacher, always reminded him that the lessons of the past will always open a window of victory for the future. However, seeing the dietary routine of the first Hokage told him that it belonged on a gossip vine, rather than a history textbook. As the teacher droned on, Naruto took the distraction to eye his classmates. It didn't take him long to recognize his peers as they were either snoring, out of their minds, or paying fierce attention to the lesson like it was, a lifeline. He could only remember a few names from the bunch, most of them clan heirs. If he didn't know any better, he would have sworn that they were something important to a story plot somehow like the characters of the Jammin Ninja. Manga he reads sometimes. He looked at some of the cast of Pierre's that were somewhat listening to the lesson. The first one he spied on was, the Inuzuka heir, Kiba. He wasn't the smartest kid in the world, but according to the locals, his family were unrivaled using dog-wolf-like senses in combat. From what little he gleaned in his basic human anatomy lessons, Kiba's one weakness is his primary inheritance, the heightened hearing and sight that the Inuzuka was famous for. They a certain frequency, and they are down for the count. Thankfully, there aren't many that use sound for a base, so the Inuzuka felt little resistance to regular combat. Looking to his right from the snoring Inuzuka, Naruto spied the snoozing Shikamarinara. He was possibly the laziest student in the entire school, but his strategies when fully focused could be something only legends could devise. However, the rate of such strategies occurring would be as likely as a yellow stone containing a powerful electric shock. He would have spied on others, but the bell rang signaling the end of class. As he strode outside, he spotted the two girls who stood very vividly in his memories. 
Sakura Hirano was a girl that was very shy until she met a rival, Ino. They were best friends before they grew into the age where boys were cute and thoughts of marriage drifted into their heads. Their target. Sasuke Chia. It didn't help any other male's case that the boy had the cliché tragic past, the dark hair and the goal that could somehow be directed and cured by every girl that came into range and had a rosy view of their world. Since that day, everything changed, and sometimes change didn't mean maturity. Sakura changed drastically from her former shyness. She was, now outgoing, had long hair and was, competing to be Sasuke's number one fan. It was, widely believed that she joined the academy in an effort to be close to the Ichiha survivor. She must have believed that grades meant something to the boy, because her efforts in books and written assignments went above and beyond the grading requirements, making her one of the brightest academy students on paper. Her efforts physically were another story. Her studious efforts somehow overshadowed her bare minimum efforts in the physical portion of the academy criteria. It was somehow rumored that the Ichiha boy wanted a good wife that was both beautiful and well-mannered. Acting on the rumor, the girls in the year older than the boy and the girls in the same age and one year younger declined from the skills that the Kanoichi standard recommended. The academy had shocking reports that the numbers of combat-ready Kanoichi lowered the year that Sasuke attended. Ino Yamanaka was similar, but the Kanoichi standard build wasn't recommended for her as her strengths were better suited as an interrogation officer as most of her clan is stationed in. She was the heir to the Yamanaka clan, a group of mind-walking individuals that steal data, possess bodies and can technically rule the world by taking over the right people. Despite all that, Ino was a relatively able and healthy girl, a rarity in the female academy graduates. She was usually the first to finish the physical runs that the academy gives weekly. In fact, she was basically the mirror darkly of Sakura. She wasn't the smartest Kanoichi, the first being Sakura, but she could outlast most of her peers in spar battles via stamina. That isn't to say that she was the perfect Kanoichi. She was still a contender in being the future mate to Sasuke Chiha, and her physique was nearly thin enough to be a defunct Kanoichi that was ill and bedridden. Naruto guessed that if the rumor for being a perfectly bodied wife for the great Ichiha survivor was a thin wafer waffle, then who was he to say otherwise? Maybe the tastes of the screwball Ichiha included wafer wives. Naruto shook his head, who cared what the Ichiha wanted? He stopped his thought train he had to realize just now that practically everyone who wanted the Ichiha clan restored cared, and those that put all their hopes and expectations for the boy to shell out enough offspring to revitalize the Ichiha police force cared. The Ichiha, who once protected the city of Kanoha before they were wiped out in one night by an assailant. He didn't know anyone who could have that kind of power, but it must have been someone unexpected that wiped them out. He tried asking the old man, but he was silent as stone on the matter. He stopped asking when the old man didn't budge on the matter and life went on. As he passed by the two girls bickering when he overheard something that nearly caused him to stumble. You're right. There is no such thing as ghosts. Sakura said in disbelief, and in a tone that said what the hell was she doing with this pig. Ino looked like she was about to be ill, if what the tone of voice was going by. Ino was a gossip by heart though, and she loved talking about things that people didn't want anyone else to hear about. I wouldn't be talking to you if it wasn't so juicy. I saw a ghost, it was a cat. At that point, both girls saw Naruto stumble but recover immediately. Both girls rolled their eyes and were just thinking Baka. To Naruto though, things more important than what two girls thought of him arose. Naruto had to find his teacher and tell him of this new development. Neither Ino or Sakura didn't notice that Naruto left at a quicker pace than normal as they started another fight over their precious Asu-kun. Three years ago, Naruto Uzumaki was afraid of the hateful glares that the boy experienced when he went into the civilian marketplace. This forced the old man to change the living areas of the boy, since there was always the fear that some insane group of people would try something idiotic, like getting a mob and attacking the boy's home, or even attacking the boy believing he was the demon. Utter lunacy, but still possible. Returning to his shabby-looking apartment in his living area, Naruto opened the door to a rather modernized home. It came up to the old man that in order to hide Naruto from the jealousy that will surely come with the already hateful glares, he had to make it look on the outside a housing so unbelievably bad, it wouldn't even make a poor destitute homeless person desire to live here. Hence, the birth of the poor housing that Naruto lived in. Naruto thought it could go without the smell, but who was he to ask? He had this building practically all to himself, and the few who tried to sneak in here for a quick room for anything were escorted out by the random Anbu agent that was assigned to watch over him. After putting away the things the academy needed for the day near a corner in the room, Naruto went into the kitchen and rummaged around for something to eat. There wasn't much choice since his fridge held only a half-full carton of milk and some cold ramen. Naruto wasn't one to waste food, let alone ramen, which he would never throw away for any reason. 
After drinking from the carton of milk, he closed the door and turned to see Gato staring at him, as if waiting for him. You really should check your expiration dates on your food. You just drank half-spoiled milk. He said simply to the shocked boy, who opened the fridge door and checked the date. Naruto paled, that damn alley cat was, right. Gato sighed at the inattentiveness of his apprentice and strode over to the panicking boy. Listen up, this provides a good lesson on checking your food for any poisons, or in this case, expiration dates. If you had a healing demon with you, that demon could cast Pazimuti on you to remove that poison out of your system. But since you don't even know how to talk to a demon without it scratching your eyes out, you'll have to write it out. Naruto glared at the cat for making the situation so freaking clear. He could already feel his insides rumble with the rotten milk in protest. Groaning, Naruto made for his bathroom where he would spend most of the afternoon. Later on in the evening, under the cover of night, Gaudo began his lessons on Naruto's swordplay. The sword that Naruto used in combat several days prior was hanging on a shelf inside a closet that Naruto reserved for special stuff. He was currently trying to use a regular sword that Gaudo somehow acquired for their nightly lessons. It wasn't too heavy for the child, but it sometimes unbalanced the kid during some of the more tougher chains of sword movements. You don't seem to have the balance to use a regular sword. I wonder if an axe is what you excel at. Gaudo wondered to himself as he watched Naruto stumble for the eighth time on a sequin sword movement. Naruto declared that he would master the sword in no time, and Gaudo believed him, but maybe it's the spirit of the axe inside the sword that makes him so skillful in the combat zone. Unfortunately, Gaudo can only recover one type of spirit sword every month or so, since the preparation for the journey where he kept them takes nearly a month to plan, even if he knew where he put them. He was curious about what kinds of weapons that Naruto can wield with ease, and what weapons that Naruto would have the skill of a baby with a bomb for a toy. Alright Naruto, you can stop. I think I might know what your weakness in the routine is. In order to fix that, I'll have to retrieve an axe for you to wield and see what you can do with that. Gaudo said to a slightly disappointed Naruto, who thought he could use this sword just as well as that spirit sword he had locked up in his special closet. I lend the practice here and move on to my next lesson, which involves you talking to demons. Gaudo said to a sullen Naruto, who still felt a small twinge of guilt for taking out those two demons. You must know that there are demons who would join your side for a variety of things. The most common exchange is your offering of blood or stamina to the creature among other things. Some take money, and some just need a good conversation to join your cause. However, since the technology that the Itagarasu used to store demons were lost during the Great Destruction, I've had to gather parts from natural resources in order to makeshift one of our storing devices. I am almost finished with reconstructing one, so you'll be able to test one out on the field soon. Gaudo finished to an attentive Naruto, who got over his little bout of guilt. What happens if you try to talk to a demon without this device ready? He asked, Gaudo nodded. His charge may be a blockhead, but he knew what questions to ask sometimes. Usually they go away, disappointed in not being able to join you. There are some who take it the wrong way and go holy hell on you for insulting them. Usually a beatdown of the demon is required for them to learn their place. Gaudo was about to continue when he felt a foreign presence hiding in the tree line area of Naruto's home. Naruto must have noticed it too, since he was also looking in the same direction he was. I know you're there, come out. Gaudo barked out his demand. Naruto held his sword at the ready for combat, should the need arise. What came out made Gaudo frown in confusion, and Naruto go white as a sheet. It was the ghost girl. The ghostly girl seemed to be nervous at being found out, but it looked like she was observing Naruto for quite a long time now, as she wasn't so much afraid of him than she was of Gaudo. This is Gaudo began, but Naruto cut him off. It's the ghost girl. I thought ghosts couldn't leave their haunting areas. I'm scared. Naruto was running around in circles around the area, as if that would repel the giggling girl. Gaudo sighed, blockhead indeed. Gaudo landed on Naruto's head with expert timing and stopped him by scratching the head of the boy, who hissed in pain again. Ow that hurts. Naruto complained as he tenderly touched the wound that the cat gave him. The girl, concerned for the pain that Naruto was going through began chanting something while touching the stiff Naruto who was stock still at a girl, ghost a real touched him so familiarly. A few more chants and Naruto's wounds began to heal faster than he would regularly heal, and that was saying something. His wounds, mostly small bumps and bruises, were almost immediately healed before an hour had passed. Dot dot just as I thought. She didn't have the right type, but she's definitely one of the Tenshi clan. Gaudo said aloud. The ghostly girl laughed melodically and nodded, while Naruto was perplexed at this info. Who were the Tenshi clan? Was it one of the lower civilian clans or something? What's a Tenshi clan? He voiced his question. Gaudo looked at the girl before continuing. We have several demons categorized by element, alignment and what kind of clan they belong to. For example, Ajiteyu and Fang Huang are clan brothers because they belong to the Raichu clan. 
Those demons are mostly winged demons, resembling birds. Gaudo paused before fishing up. She's still relatively young, but she belongs to the Tenchi clan. I had some inkling of what she was, but I believe in absolute certainty that she is an angel. Naruto was, stunned, he's actually seeing a real angel for the first time. Wow. You're an angel. He asked a smiling girl, who giggled and nodded happily. Gaudo watched the scene a little more before speaking again. According to our lore, every person on the planet has one angel that guides their actions and protects them from various evils. I think this may be your personal guardian angel. Gaudo paused and got an idea from it. You, angel. He waited until the girl was, paying attention to him. Gaudo smiled internally, this was, perfect. How would you like to be Naruto's first demon partner? He asked the girl, who nodded and turned to face a startled Naruto. Gaudo turned a moment later as well. Okay, Naruto, this plays right into our lesson plans. This angel is already loyal to you, so it would be easier to convince her to join you than other demons. However, she isn't fully ready to fight at your side, and this is where our next lesson begins. The Art of Negotiation. I've collected data from the 14th and for the most part, demons require some form of blood payment or would like money, in exchange for a contract with the summoner. I'll hand you some money that I've acquired, and you use that to convince this angel to fight for you. Gaudo threw to Naruto a small bag of coins as he finished his explanation. Again. Gaudo ordered his disciple. Naruto nodded and faced the young angel. When he made eye contact with her, however, time seemed to freeze. When he turned around, he saw that everything but him and the angel stopped moving. A slight shuffling of the angel told Naruto that he should pay attention to her and not the surroundings. Naruto blushed in embarrassment and rubbed the back of his head with one arm. Ah. Sorry about that, first time, he. He laughed nervously. The angel smiled in response and nodded. He never heard her speak so he was, startled by the voice that came out of the girl. Hi. I heard from that cat that you want me to be your demon. The angel asked. Her voice is quite melodious. Naruto figured since she was a demon, her voice would be more deep, like a regular demon. Why yeah sorry, I'm a bit nervous. Naruto admitted to the girl. You might want to stand a bit straighter, or else demons will find that offensive and attack you. I'm sure you don't want that, do you? Angel asked the boy, who nodded at the advice. Okay like this. Naruto straightened his back. Angel shook his head. It's too stiff, it makes you look fake. There are some demons like a kunanashi who like that kind of thing, but mostly a straighter back means respect to most demons. The angel lectured as she pushed Naruto's back into a more manly pose. A far outcry from the slouch that Naruto was so accustomed to. Okay. Now this is a respectable pose. Let's continue. The angel clapped her hands at her soon-to-be master's new pose. Now, here comes the more critical part, the terms of servitude. The angel said as she stood in a thinking pose, her hand cupping her tiny chin. Naruto thought she looked cute, like a chibi trying to do a serious thinking pose. I want some of your blood to satisfy my bloodlust. The angel asked Naruto, who was shocked and pale. Was this angel a vampire in disguise? What? Aren't angels like holy beings? They don't like drinking blood, do they? Naruto asked the giggling girl. We may be angels, but every demon you ask an alliance with will ask for a bit of blood from their potential summoner. Fortunately for you, I only require a tiny bit of blood in order to satisfy my bloodlust for a lifetime. Angel explained to an understanding Naruto. How much blood do you need? He asked the girl. Angel smiled, her master wasn't foolhardy, and gave up his energy foolishly. He was, new, but he had survival instincts that would have rivaled Master Ural. Just cut your palm open and drop a few drops of blood on my hands. Angel told the boy as she cupped her hands in front of the boy. Naruto nodded and took out his sword. He cut his palm and shook a tiny amount of blood onto her cupped hands. Naruto was surprised that his hand had healed quickly after the cut and didn't notice the angel drink his blood almost messily. When he turned back to the angel, he could see no trace of his blood anywhere on the girl. It was almost as if it was licked clean. Naruto mentally shrugged, it was probably a demon thing. The angel smiled once again in satisfaction, it seemed that he fulfilled her requirements, but, oh yes I have one other request. The angel said of Naruto. Naruto could almost guess what it was and was, fingering the pouch of coins carefully. What is it? The angel started looking around and twiddling her fingers almost cutely. I kin to have a sweet tooth, but there aren't many people who would give up money for such a thing, so can I have that pouch of money? She smiled almost childlike and comically. Naruto sighed, he was, right on the money literally. He tossed a small pouch of money as the angel cheered at the acquiescence of her request and almost hugged the pouch at her plans to buy all the candy she could. Okay. I think that's enough, I'm ready to go with you. She smiled and pulled out a rectangular piece of paper to hand to a confused Naruto. Here's my business card. I feel like such a grown-up. The angel laughed as Naruto looked for a place to store his new business card. 
He found it odd, but it's a demon thing, he reminded himself. Good job Naruto. You have successfully recruited this angel. Now, her hazy figure will fade away, allowing you to see her unique form. Gaudo commented as what he said came to be. The angel started to solidify her ghostly form, and both Naruto and Gout were surprised to see the girl's form. Where there would usually be a blue-haired or blonde-haired angel, this one had fiery red hair, and her eyes were aquatic blue. She had a confident face, and her posture seemed like she would bolt at any second from a prank or two that she caused. Her wings were still the same length though. She was, certainly unique, Gaudo thought to himself. Do you have a name, Angel Chan? Naruto asked the girl, who pondered. I might have had one when I was, alive, but since we are all mass assigned to guard people, some angels forget their previous identities. I still remember some of it though. It was, something like Kushi something or other. Naruto instinctively called out a name from somewhere in the recesses of his mind. It might have been a lost memory. Kishina? He asked, and the angel seemed to think on it before nodding. Yeah I think that was, my name, Kishina. The angel turned to Naruto and stuck out her hand to shake his. My name is Kishina, and I'm your partner. She grinned in a way that made Gaudo's eyes widen. There is no way could she really be. Naruto didn't seem to see the similarities and shook her hand enthusiastically. My name is Naruto Uzumaki, do you like Raymond? He asked Kishina, who nodded very happily. I love Raymond. How did you know? She exclaimed to a grinning Naruto. I think we'll get along just fine. I know a great place, come on. He said as he pulled Kishina's hand to his favorite place in the world, Ichiraku's Raymond. Hold it, Naruto. Gato called out. Naruto and Kishina turned to the cat in confusion. While you can see her Naruto, other people can't. Those who are spiritually sensitive like you are can't see them fully, but normal people cannot. Don't you think it will get awkward if you order two bowls of ramen for someone who isn't there? Gato pointed out and Kishina nodded in agreement. Naruto however, grinned. You haven't seen me eat ramen, have you? Naruto chuckled and Gato got the feeling that he was going to see something that will haunt his dreams forever. While the trio were witnessing Naruto's talent, something sinister was happening elsewhere. The girl was running away in fear of something that wasn't there. She came across the slain bodies of her parents, and a low growl told her that the thing spotted her. She turned over trash cans and went through the deserted roads of nighttime Kanoha in order to evade whatever was chasing her. Her luck ended however, as she was cornered by a dead end in Kanoha's shopping district. Looking in fear, she screamed as a green humanoid monster stalked slowly to her. The monster growled hungrily, splotches of blood were on his mouth, and the girl stared horrified that her parents' blood was on this freak. She screamed loudly as the monster pounced on her, and her screams of terror slowly faded as the monster ended her life. Her body wasn't found till the next morning by a horrified shopkeeper, who found her remains and her face in absolute terror. These were the chatters that filled the student hallways when Naruto entered the academy a couple of days after meeting Kishina, his angel demon partner. She was fine with the fact that there wasn't a device to store her ready yet and spent her time flying around the village. She would always take a trip to the grocery store to satisfy her very sweet addiction to candy. Naruto was hearing snippets of the chatter and wondered what was going on. To rile up a school like this it was big at least. As Naruto entered his classroom, he was waved at by Ino. Why would she talk to him, he didn't know. She probably wanted to gossip about what was going on. Hey Naruto, listen to this. Ino began. Naruto's intuition was right in one again. She just wanted to spread the news. What is it? Naruto asked, he was curious about the chatter too. Ino looked around and whispered in his ear. Imiko's dead. They found her body yesterday. Ino gushed out the news, and Naruto was shocked at the news, one of their classmates was dead. Imiko Agabashi was a student in Naruto's year and wasn't one to stand out, preferring to blend into the crowd. She was in the middle range in their tests, but the sudden news of her death stunned many of those who knew her and didn't, so the rumors flew. Before Naruto could ask Ino on what else happened to their classmate, their teacher entered the classroom. Okay, settle down now. We have a lesson to begin. The teacher said to the rowdy students. While some quieted immediately, there were still a few students chattering about the rumors. I said settle down. We are all shocked about the news of Yumiko, but we must move on. Let's begin where we left off, Sandame's rise to the seat of Hokage Naruto tuned out the lesson and tried to get some more info on the truth of the rumor. His only option was, Ino, who sat in the row in front of him. Naruto took out some paper and scribbled down a note before tossing it to the girl. It landed with a plop on the girl's head before landing on her lap. Ino looked around and ticked off, but read the note from Naruto. She glared a bit for ruining her attention to the history lesson, but scribbled back a reply and tossed it to a waiting Naruto. I'll tell you after school, meet me behind the main building. Ino. Naruto nodded to an unseen Ino, who turned back to the lesson. He'll just have to be patient and learn the news from her later. 
While Naruto was at school, Gaudo and Kashina were examining the body of the slain girl in the Konoha hospital. Kashina brought the matter to Gaudo as she overheard some gossiping housewives while walking through the shopping district. Her ears burned hot at the news and she flew back, naturally invisible to humans. All the way to Gaudo, the cat in Naruto's home. Since they are naturally invisible to the human eye, they had no trouble slipping past the security and looking for the girl. They were in luck that the corpse was, still in the operating table, in the middle of an autopsy from what the pair saw. They waited until the staff left for a break in order to investigate the body at least what was left of it. The horror frozen face was relaxed into a sleeping face in order to stop the unnervingness of the doctors performing the procedure, but the damage from her mysterious death was still there, but covered by a blue sheet. The doctors were in the middle of the autopsy and left a portion of the sheet open to show the wounds of the girl. The girl had gaping wounds all over the abdomen area, as if being stabbed repeatedly through the stomach. The area around the throat was ripped off and what looked like chewed on by a fang or so. Some of her organs were missing as well. Her heart, her stomach and her pancreas were all missing, as if she was being picked apart for certain organs. Baudo stared at the sight and tried to remember what could have caused this. It could be a wild animal, but he doubted that the ninja on patrol would allow such a wild thing on the loose. So the only things that come to mind is an insane person committing cannibalism, or it looks to be the work of a demon. It could be a member from the Yuki clan. Gaudo explained his reasoning. Kishina looked at the body, feeling sorry for the last moments that the girl must have experienced, it was a slow death, to be sure. Let's go, we have to return to the house in order to meet Naruto in time for his lessons. Gaudo explained as he hopped into an open window. Kishina nodded and left through the doorway, since she was too big to fit through the window. After Naruto met up with Ino to learn more from the rumor, he was reviewing what she told him. Apparently, they found the girl lying in her own pool of blood, but the ninja assigned to the hospital sector in recovering dead people mentioned that there was less blood than usual for a girl her age. It almost seemed that the girl's blood was being drained. When they tried to locate the parents, the ninja were further shocked to find that the parents also suffered the same fate. To the investigating ninja, this is a gruesome murder. As he rounded the corner to his house and entered the disguised home, he turned to face Gaudo and Kishina. He felt that to Gaudo, it was just as simple as a mystery to solve. Naruto, it looks like we have something happening in the village today. Gaudo began, but Naruto nodded that he knew. Yeah, I heard. It was a murder of a girl, wasn't it? Gaudo nodded. Correct. This is a little early for you, but this is a rare opportunity for your training as a devil summoner. Gaudo nodded to Kishina, who held a folder with some papers in it. When I was overseeing the 14th, he used to work as a detective protecting his region from the supernatural phenomena that seeps out into the real world. The real world? Naruto asked. When I was alive, there was a separate world exclusively for demons. It was a dark mirror of the region in which they inhabited. If there was a town there, you can guarantee that there was a dark mirror of the town inhabited by demons. I don't know what happened to the girl, but I do know this. This was the work of a demon, and the victim somehow entered the dark world of Konoha. Gaudo revealed his findings to his shocked student. Whoa so what is my part in all this? Naruto asked. Gaudo stared at the boy, he may or may not take this well. Since I'm training you to be the newest devil summoner, I want you to spend time in this dark world and find out what caused this girl's death. Kishina will be there to help in combat matters, but mostly she will be there where I cannot. I'll be with you until you find the rep of space where the dark world demons are coming from. After that, I won't be able to help you. As a spirit, the dark energy prevents me from entering. If I was alive in a body, I could enter with you, but since that isn't so you get the idea. Naruto nodded. When do we get started? He asked his teacher. Gaudo looked up at the sky, it was getting a bit late to start immediately. We will start tomorrow after your studies. Come here immediately and we'll set out to find this rip in space. We can't let another victim enter this rip and get themselves killed. With the plan in motion, all three members decided on what to eat. Naruto suggested Raymond, but Gaudo shot down that idea, he didn't want more nightmares anytime soon after the other day's demonstration. Both Naruto and Kishina looked crestfallen, since both loved the stuff. The next morning Naruto arrived at school with the plan fresh in his mind, but the question was, where the rip was, located. He doubted that any of the rumor mills knew about a rip in the fabric of space, so that was, out. Naruto thought back to where the girl and her parents' bodies were found. He could always check the area, but he doubted that the investigating ninja would let him through to the scene of the crime. He thought of one other source, but it was such a long shot still, he could see no other option. It was time to get some info from the school gossip. If you ask Eno how her day was spent, you would never believe that the school loser would demand any and all rumors of what happened to Yumiko. But it happened, and her nose for more rumors peaked at the sudden curiosity about all the questions. Especially from Naruto of all people. 
After telling all the rumors to the dead son, she had a nagging reminder to follow Naruto after school. This was too good a rumor to pass up and not spread. By this time tomorrow, the whole school will know of Naruto's dealings. As soon as the school's lessons ended with a bell, Ino had to painstakingly stop herself from following Sasuke-kun and force herself to follow Naruto at a distance, who seemed to be snooping around the shopping area. If following Sasuke-kun taught her anything, it was to be patient as Sasuke would stop sometimes abruptly on his way home. When Naruto sighed at another dead end, he could only move on to another of Ino's rumors and move on. Ino did various things while appearing incognito to a snooping Naruto like visiting the shops and hiding behind stalls whenever Naruto would turn back to look behind him. Ino guessed that he might know that someone was following him, but wasn't sure of it. Ino's previous lessons with her father in espionage tactics that he used during his missions made her deducting skills a little sharper than most ninja, but it was rough at best. After seeing Naruto turn a corner and into a dead end, Ino waited a few minutes before following him. What she saw was a little startling. She saw a cat. And it was talking to Naruto. The talking cat was speaking to the dead last, and he wasn't freaked out about it. This was rumor gold. Hiding away in a nearby stack of discarded wooden barrels, she listened into the conversation that the cat and the dead son was having. It seems that you found the rip, Naruto. How did you find out about it? The girl at school is a major gossip, and she told me about the normal routines that the victim follows. Naruto replied. Ino raised her eyebrow, the Naruto she knew wouldn't be using such words like routine or victim. Instead, she was sure he would use simple words like the lowbrow male persona he always showed off in front of his classmates. Maybe the rumors of his stupidity were a little exaggerated. Well, from here on out, you are on your own. I trust you know the plan right? You don't need a reminder do you? The cat asked Naruto, who shook his head. Alright, I'll meet you back at the house as soon as you come back from your investigation. Don't get killed out there, this realm is very different from what you are used to. The cat ordered and watched as Naruto stopped before the wooden fence, and Ino was watching intently. Her eyes must have been playing tricks on her, as Naruto suddenly vanished. After looking from her hiding spot for anyone watching, she found none, she searched the dead end thoroughly for the dead last. That was a neat thing that he performed, and she couldn't wait until she got it out of him. As she neared the place where Naruto vanished, her hand suddenly went through the seemingly solid wooden fence. Whoa. Ino gasped as she pulled her hand out of the rippling wooden fence. It was surreal. After a moment, Ino's mind was racing at the new info on Yumiko's death. She knew something that the investigating ninja didn't, and it would make quite the story. First however, she had to find out where this rippling thing led to. This was a discovery that only she and Naruto knew, and it was sure to make her more popular at school. She hesitated for a moment before walking through the rippling fence, unknowing that the cat was staring from behind her. He stood still for a moment before walking away from the fence, wondering if that girl would survive her little run in the dark world. The dark world of Kanoha felt like normal Kanoha, only draped in darkness, and some of the buildings were a little aged and in disrepair. Walking with Kishina at his side, Naruto held the special sword that he used at his waist, where he tied the scabbard to a hoop in his pants. Aldo suggested wearing darker clothing when going into this realm, in order to not stand out and be attacked by some of the more confident demons. Naruto had to ditch his orange attire and don a darker gray shirt and black pants. A long black open cloak was on his shoulders, making for a rather far cry from his usual bright clothing. He was walking silently in the open, as Naruto was told by Gaudo that it didn't matter if he moved next to the walls or in the open, as demons will always attack. Naruto was trained in basic combat, and it was in his best interests to be attacked in the open for a better movement range than being cornered somewhere. For the most part, eerily watchful eyes watched Naruto crossing into their realm, but kept at bay. Naruto noticed the presence, but kept walking. He had no reason to actively hunt the demons yet, let them come to him. Ino landed on the other side of the wooden fence in a world that was totally too dark for her. Her purple attire that was so suited for the bright side of Kanoha was too bright for this dankly place. On top of that, Ino couldn't find Naruto anywhere. Seeing no choice available to her, she moved forward and into a town that seemed to be the dark-sided belly of Kanoha. A few hours into his investigation, Naruto saw a group of demons talking in the open. They were chattering in a language that he didn't understand, so he asked Kishina to translate what they were saying. Kishina listened to the conversation and started translating for her contractor. They are saying that the boss demon got a hold of a human girl who wandered in here a few hours ago. It looks like it hasn't been the first time this boss demon did this to a human. She told Naruto, whose eyes widened at another kidnapping. Could he be the one that killed that girl? He asked his partner. She pondered the question for a moment before nodding slowly. I think he might, but we can't be certain until we meet this boss demon face to face. Kishina looked around her surroundings as it got a little quieter as they were talking. No doubt that the denizens were watching them carefully. 
the sudden rustle in the bushes to their right alerted them to somebody approaching their position. Kishina started chanting in low tones as her hands started to glow with green energy. Naruto held his sword with two hands, no doubt ready to dish out axe-type damage to whatever was approaching them. What they didn't expect was a human girl to stumble out of the bushes. This girl had long blonde hair with twigs in it and her clothes looked rumpled. Almost as if she was running away and dashed through the bushes desperately. Her widened eyes told her that she found what she was looking for and didn't notice Kashina as she tackled him with surprising force. Oh my god. I finally found you. Save me, Naruto, these monsters are chasing me. Ino was panicked as she kept rambling random facts to a confused Naruto. By normal standards, anyone would go on to a 5-minute shock fest at another being finding out his lifelong secret activities, followed by a so easy battle that he would then be forced into sharing said secret. Naruto didn't know jack about this world, he was just an apprentice left in a forest of wolves. He didn't mind sharing this world, since it wasn't his to begin with. He wasn't so experienced that any demons encountered would be completely owned by his skills. What did happen correctly though, was, there was, a set of demons in front of him. They were possibly shocked that another being like the girl was here, but they quickly got into their battle stances, ready to kill them both. Naruto eyed his opponents. They were small demons, and they seemed to work on the fact that strength equals numbers. He recognized one of the demons, from his bowl cut hair covering his eyes as an Abarian. What? Another fool to knock around. Abarian said. His posture said that he was the leader of the pack. The other demons of the pack, just two others, were staring menacingly. Like good little thugs, Naruto was reminded very much of from the Jam and Ninja manga. The thugs there acted a lot like the demons here. I don't know what you want with her, but get the hell out of here. Naruto shouted out at the group. The thug demons looked ready to follow that order, but the Abarian didn't seem to be affected. Don't think you can order me around, human. Attack. The Abarian shouted, and the demons immediately responded by lunging toward Naruto. Naruto couldn't see the forms fully because of the dark shadows, but now in the open, he could see the thugs clearly. The green blob that Naruto recognized as a slime. He remembered the shape because he was chased by one when he first met Gato. Another was a flesh-ridden skeleton warrior known only as a Turdak. From what Gato told him, Turdak often travels alone. At most, only a pair of Turks were seen traveling together, since most Turdak groups tend to fight each other to the death. Add that with the Abarian, and they were facing a 3-2 fight. The Turdak let out a roar and charged toward a ready Naruto, who held his blade in a guarding stance. The Turdak's double swords clashed with Naruto's own sword, and a fierce struggle happened between the combatants. All the while, the Turdak was slowly becoming enraged that a mere human could have matched his skills in the sword. While the struggle was happening, Ino was watching the fight with awe. Naruto never showed skill in the academy like this before. He would always suck when throwing his kunai set and would always struggle in basic skills. Seeing him like this was, like a spirit was, possessing his body or something. She didn't notice the blob sneak up behind her until it let out a squelching sound. When Ino turned, all she could see was, a fading wind-based image and a winged woman flying off to where Naruto was. She tried to warn Naruto, but she saw the woman fighting alongside that fighting skeleton. They seemed to be working well together as the woman's green energy was, repeatedly being thrown at the skeleton. Each orb of energy that hit near the skeleton was instantly transformed into a mini funnel of wind, kind of like a futon dot. Naruto grunted, it was time to end this. Gripping his sword in his familiar axe fashion, he commanded Kishina to distract her dak while he got into his beginning stance like how Gato taught him. Spreading his legs vertically, he swung upwards toward the side of Turdak and launched him up into the air. All the while, blood from the wound was spilling into the ground below, and he had to wonder where the blood was being stored. After a few seconds, he jumped into the air aided by some of the chakra he started to tap into. When he reached about the same height in the air as Turdak, he threw his sword up into the air above, and Naruto put his hands into a seal. From below, Ino frowned. That seal wasn't part of any set of seals that the academy taught them and to her, Naruto wasn't exactly aware of the set he was doing. Bunshin no Ino's eyes widened, that was, not the seal set for Bunshin, not by a long shot. However, eight copies of Naruto appeared surrounding that skeleton. What she saw was only what she could describe as a work of bloody art. The original Naruto gripped his sword, and the copies pulled out their own copies of the sword. After Naruto said something she couldn't quite hear, Naruto dropped down. He brought his sword down on the skull in a way a barbarian using an axe would do. She saw the copies swing through the body of the skeleton, as Bunshin weren't supposed to do any damage. She was proven wrong as the nine fine slash marks appeared on the shocked skeleton. His primal roar of pain faded as he just fell apart in a spray of blood, bones and fading copies of Naruto. 
When the original Naruto landed skillfully on the floor, Ino thought he looked more like a seasoned ninja than a dead last at the academy. The leader of the group, now turned into a solo act, a Baryon was, cowed. Right in front of his eyes were the result of his men slaughtered by those meddling fools. He thought he could score some brownie points by kidnapping a second girl, but that plan went out the window. It was, time to make a quick retreat. The RR you may have defeated me, but this was, just a fancy of mine. My job's done anyways, keep that blonde wafer. A Baryon taunted before running into the shadows of Dark Konoha. Ino growled, she wasn't a wafer. Naruto sighed before returning his sword to his scabbard. He almost thought that Ino was, the kidnapped girl, but it looked like there was, one other girl in this world that wasn't supposed to be here. Are you alright? He asked of a still fuming Ino, who was, still ticked off about the wafer comment. After discarding her anger, she nodded to Naruto. Then the questions and comments came. Are you an Anbu agent Naruto where did you learn all those cool moves? You almost looked as cool as Sasuke-kun. The gasp from Ino. Did Sasuke-kun teach you that? Ino tried to connect Naruto's fighting ability to something that Sasuke would do, but it didn't fit somehow. Naruto glared at the mention of Sasuke. Did everything have to happen through Sasuke? It's like saying that the meaning of life is inside Sasuke's butt. Naruto shuddered at the mental image he would need a lot of Raymond to forget that. No, I'm pretty sure that the great Sasuke-kun doesn't know how to do this. I'm just an academy student, and that is top secret. Naruto tried to answer what questions Ino spewed out, but it didn't seem to satisfy one's curiosity. Where are we then? Ino asked a question that Naruto could answer easily. We are in Dark Konoha village. This is a village meant for the demons of this world. Ino nodded confusedly. Even if she did tell about what happened to her, it's a little tall to prove, and she was sure that other children wouldn't be as lucky to have Naruto engage the demons every time if they came into this world on their own. Demons? Demons don't exist at least I thought that was the case until today. Ino asked and answered herself. Naruto nodded and looked toward Kishina, who nodded and flew into the sky. Who's that Naruto? She's very pretty. Ino commented on Kishina's beauty. That's Kishina, she's my demon partner. Naruto told a shocked Ino. That girl was a demon like those freaks. She's a demon too. She looks so human. Naruto had a feeling that the few people who can see Kishina will say the same thing over and over. She's a demon, but she's also my partner. We are working together to find out what killed Yumiko. Naruto replied to Ino's comment, who looked a little ashamed at a thoughtless comment. What kind of demon is she? Do you think one of these demons killed Yumiko? Ino asked as she saw the girl, Kishina return from flying around the dark world. She's an angel from the Tenshi clan. We think a demon might have gotten out of this world or that Yumiko might have entered this world and has gotten killed. Naruto answered Ino as Kishina whispered something in a language that Ino couldn't understand. Wow, you can understand that, Naruto. Ino asked, amazed that the dead son could understand such a complicated language. Naruto, for his part, looked confused. What are you talking about? She speaks our language Naruto was, interrupted by Kishina talking in her language. Oh, I see it looks like she can only speak to people like me. Naruto answered Ino's confusion, people like him. Was, he an alien or something? People like you? Are you a demon or something too? Ino asked. No, I'm a devil summoner, Naruto stated proudly. An awkward silence went between them, what the heck is a devil summoner? Ino asked after a while. Naruto didn't have an answer to that, since he didn't know it fully either. Just what was a devil summoner? I dunno it's all new to me too. Naruto replied. Ino felt that he didn't know either and accepted the answer with a nod. So what are you going to do now? I don't think I can lead you back to the other side. We are too far in and we could get attacked at any time. Ino smiled. She may be a gossip, but she was also very adventurous. It was getting stale in the academy, and rumor spreading can only go so far, after all. I might as well hang out with you, this world is very interesting. Besides, I'm sure that angel is sure to take advantage of you. She said slyly. Naruto and Kishina both looked confused and docked their heads to the side at the same time, not getting the innuendo at all. Ino sighed, guessing it was true. Girls do mature faster than boys, she just assumed that angels were the same. Never mind, let's just go. Ino ordered and started walking deeper into the murky city. Naruto could only shake his head as he followed her. She might not have noticed, but she was very bossy. Walking behind Naruto was a giggling Kishina, she liked this girl. It was nighttime in Kanoha when a tired Hokage finally finished his paperwork for the day. He couldn't wait to head back home and enjoy a good cup of sake and a good book by a roaring fire. Gathering up his pipe and coat, he walked toward the double doors of his office when the doors were busted open by a panicking Inoichi Yamanaka. Hokage Zama. Inoichi yelled at the old leader rather chivy-like. Like a child to his grandfather. Saratobi frowned, he could handle this from Naruto, but a grown man. 
Picking a sobbing mess that used to be in Waichi, he could smell the alcohol in his breath. It looked like he was drunk before stumbling in here like this. Inoichi, calm yourself. Do you want your wife to look like this? Again? The aged Hokage threatened, sort of. It worked remarkably well as Inoichi froze and almost instantly sobered up with chakra to his brain. Useful things, chakra. From wounds to hangover cures, was, there no thing it couldn't stop. Tsuritobi paused, oh yeah death. Now, what happened here? Tsuritobi ushered the moaning Inoichi to a chair in his office and sat him down. My daughter Ino she's missing. Inoichi said, working up into a panic. Saratobi sighed at the man's personality. He was a decent ninja, but he hasn't seen action in a long time. Could working at a flower shop turn such a hardened veteran of the ninja corps into a drunken, sobbing mess? He has to assign some B-ranked missions to Inoichi sometime soon, or else it would be a repeat of what happened here tonight. He thought about his other two teammates, but he wouldn't want to waste missions on seemingly normal clan heads and imposing on their duties to the clans they lead. Okay, let's calm down Inoichi. Perhaps she is at a friend's house. I recall that Miss Yamanaka is a very popular girl at the academy, isn't she? Saratobi was concerned for the girl, but he wasn't convinced to send out Anbu squads for a girl that might be at a friend's house. But she tells her mother or me when she goes to sleep over at a friend's house. She didn't and I checked all of her friends that she slept over with. Now Saratobi was on heightened alert. This might be a possible kidnapping, but no Anbu patrols reported anything suspicious. Let me see what I can do let me talk to the Anbu and find out where she was, last. Saratobi told the panicking father. H. Hokage-sama, I was, told by her friends that she was, last seen following Naruto in the shopping district. Now that piqued the Hokage's interest. That would make his job easier if Naruto was involved. Getting down his spying orb from the bookcase, he activated the chakra on the orb and watched to try to locate Naruto. Inoichi narrowed his eyes from the glow, but he soon found himself staring at the odd artifact that the Hokage had stashed in his office. If he was single with that orb Inoichi had a red hue on his face, and Saratobi hoped that was alcohol-induced. After a few moments he got an image and it wasn't one he hoped it would be. The piece of clothing that Naruto's seal was on wasn't being worn, and his plan to locate the blonde duo that way went down the tube. I'm sorry Inoichi, but Naruto isn't there either. It looks like they are both missing from Konoha. Saratobi declared while getting in touch with the hidden Anbu agent that guarded him constantly. After speaking orders to a nodding Anbu, Saratobi turned back to see Inoichi absorbed into the shiny piece of glass. He seemed to be getting angry too. Inoichi Saratobi asked cautiously. An angry father was, one thing, a sobbing mess of a drunken father turned angry was, another thing. I saw my daughter's skirt in that image where his jacket was. He is trying to deflower my little flower. Naruto Uzumaki must die. The pumped-up father turned berserker slammed open the Hokage's doors and stomped out into the hallway before coming back and bowing to his leader. My apologies Hokage-sama, I have to murder a little boy now for taking away my daughter's innocence. Fearful for his knucklehead grandson, the aging Hokage followed Inoichi. It was easy to catch up to the man as he didn't use any ninja skills, but instead stomped toward where he believed Naruto lived. All Saratobi could do was lead the angry Inoichi away from where Naruto lived by distracting him with other things, but all he could do was delay the inevitable. He seriously hoped that Naruto wasn't doing what Ino's father believed he was doing, or he was ground paced when Inoichi finally got a hold of him. Naruto was confused where a purple bedsheet came from all of a sudden. It was as if the wind picked up a hanging bedsheet and guided it toward an open window that Naruto left open before he went on his investigation. Giving it no thought, he kept staring at the moon, distracting himself in his memories of his previous adventures. It seemed that time is read differently in the dark realm than Naruto once thought as he looked toward the dark town's clock tower. The hands looked like they read five in the afternoon, but instead of numbers, the large hands pointed to little bars and pictures of moon phases replaced the numbers. That clock is a little strange Naruto muttered as he held back a yawn. His body must be out of whack if it was tired at 5 in the afternoon, Ino must have been tired as she was, complaining about a place to sleep. Thinking that their bodies still remembered routines in the other world, Naruto could only guess that it was nighttime outside in the real world. The one good thing about being in the dark world was that the denizens of the dark world do get tired and sleep in safe areas like empty shops and buildings. Naruto began looking for an abandoned shop to sleep in when Ino pointed out that this was the street where her home was on. Walking ahead, Ino fumbled for a key in her pocket before opening the door to her home. Naruto heard her shout, I'm home. Before he entered and locked her house's door. No need for any snooping demon to enter and have their life shortened by his blade, after all. Of all the buildings in the dark Konoha street, this was untouched in any way. It even looked clean on the floor around the door, as if someone swept the floor daily around here. Is there anywhere I can sleep, Ino? He asked a little tired from his full day of exploring the mirror town. 
Ino looked a bit uncomfortable before speaking what was on her mind. Well I don't like being alone anywhere in this world. These demons might get us while we are separated, so I'm thinking of sharing our parents' bed for tonight. Ino said with a light blush on her face. Naruto was completely red-faced, and Kishina was laughing at her contractor situation. After a bit of bickering between Naruto and the blonde girl, Kishina watched amused as Ino dragged Naruto toward what she believed was her parents' room. Kishina grinned widely, she really liked this girl. After directing Inoichi into sleeping off his drunken state and handing him off to his wife, who he could hear a loud screeching about him getting drunk, a haggard-looking Hokage traveled back to his home. He would have to wait 15 hours before he could mobilize any squad to look for the pair of blondes. As he made it into his home, he had to wonder how they were doing. Were they safe? Were they good on food? He could only wait and see what would happen. He only hoped that they were somewhere in this village and were just blowing off steam from something. As Naruto and Ino shared a bed with Kishina in Ino's room, they slept rather undisturbed, as not a single demon interrupted or broke into the housing that the pair slept in for the night. Coincidentally, Inoichi couldn't sleep very well, as he felt something on top of him. He woke up several times, but he could only feel the blanket on top of his form. He could only chalk it up to his worrying about his missing daughter, so he slept fitfully and woke up with a harsher than usual hangover. His wife didn't do anything to help him. A ray of dimmed light somehow hit Naruto's face the next morning, as he found himself in a rather compromising position. Somehow during their forced sharing of her parents' bed, Ino crawled onto Naruto and used his torso and arms for a pillow, and Naruto's arm wrapped around Ino's lithe body and around her waist. They seemed to be rather comfortable if their non-stop sleeping through the night was any indication. Naruto had a light rosy hue on his face as he assessed his situation. Ino wasn't unattractive by any means, but he was sure of the law of PMGP, parents making ground paste of him. Careful to remove himself from the tangle, he ignored Ino's murmurs of discontent at his attempts at removal. After getting away from her sleeping form, she still moaned a bit from the lost heat, Naruto went to the empty closet in the room to find his gear set up neatly inside. He doubted there was any running water or stored food inside the dark world version of Ino's home, so he put on his gear and headed outside of the bedroom as silently as he could. Outside of the room, he saw Kashina wake and alert as she walked around the house, obviously exploring the place. Her eyes seemed to drink in more of the house than what was normal. Probably because she never visited someone else's home before. Hey Kishina. Naruto called out softly. Kishina turned, curious at the question. What is it, Naruto-kun? She asked, wondering what was up. His tone of voice suggested that he didn't want to wake up the girl. She hoped they would wake up together, that would have been a funny scene. Why did Ino say that she couldn't understand you? I mean, we are talking like normal people right now, right? Naruto asked, and Kishina pondered the answer. The best thing to tell you that would explain it is that we are somehow able to understand each other because of the contract. I speak in your language so that you can understand me, and your words come out in the language of the Tenshi clan. She answered after a moment. Is the magic of the contract that powerful? Naruto asked, pulling out the business card that Kishina gave him when they met. Kishina smiled, she liked the memory too. It seemed to be deeper than that, but the meeting and contract was just a normal contract. The teachings of the Tenshi clan were very thorough on the subject throughout history. Many of the Tenshi tried to find a deeper meaning, but none have succeeded to prove anything. It could be. I wouldn't put too much thought into it, though. The Tenshi have tried and failed to find any deeper meaning. Kishina replied and turned away from Naruto, eager to explore the house more. Naruto guessed that out of all the houses Kishina visited while invisible, she could never truly visit this house. For what reason, he didn't know. After surprisingly finding several cans of food in the family's kitchen downstairs, Naruto and Kishina made a meal out of what they could. It was mostly canned fruit and some canned bread, but it was rather delicious overall. Morning Ino came downstairs to the kitchen at last, her clothing a little rumpled. It was natural since they both slept in the same clothes as yesterday. Ino was also surprised at the sight of food, but Kishina made sure to part with enough canned food for the girl, as she was sure that the other human was hungry as well. Kishina sighed at the food, it wasn't ramen, but it was a nice change of food style for once. She couldn't say the same thing for Naruto, as he wept in the absence of no ramen packets, something that she too mourned. After mentioning that there was no water to boil anyways, he straightened up and ate the fruit and bread. When Naruto gazed at the dark town's clock again, it read only the words new moon on it. Kishina gazed at the clock as well and decided to tell them what they meant. I'm sure you haven't heard of the moon phases, have you Naruto? Kishina asked. Naruto shook his head, curious about these moon phases. The time read here is the same as gazing at the moon. Understandably so since there is no sunlight. Any light at all comes from the moon, which is always there above the demon world. Kishina explained, remembering everything she learned from other angels. 
For some reason, demons who aren't contracted by devil summoners before the full moon turn feral and will often attack other demons for dominance. It goes away after the full moon is gone, but it happens so scarcely that the demons are usually wary when the phase before it appears. How many human days does it take to change phases? Naruto asked. I believe that it takes around three to four days between changes of phases. We are beginning the new moon phase, so demons are very mellow right now. There won't be as many possible encounters, but we should still keep our guard up. Kishina warned and Naruto nodded, his grip on his sword very tight. After closing the door to her home, Ino made sure to lock it, the trio made sure they were ready for another day of investigation. The new moon made the demonic stairs at them more easy to handle, since their fierceness was dulled somehow. As they neared the central area of the shopping district, Naruto felt a large pressure on himself. It was almost suffocating as he dropped to his knees to a shot Ino and Kishina. The pressure let up suddenly as Naruto could only gasp air while worrying Ino. He looked around for the source of the pressure, but found nothing out of the ordinary. The pressure must have been felt by the other demons, for their watchful eyes disappeared as well. What was that? Naruto asked. Ino shrugged, she felt a dampening in the air as Naruto dropped to his knees. Kishina looked more battle-ready as she gazed at their surroundings once more. After finding none, she calmed down. She felt the same pressure, but being in the demon world longer than her contractor, she could resist it better. After making sure Naruto was fine, the three kept going on their way. Naruto was still wondering where the source of the pressure came from when Ino suddenly spoke up. Hey this is where they found Yumiko's body. Ino gasped aloud. Naruto saw the scene for the first time without wandering ninja and curious civilians, stretching for a gaze into the scene. The place seemed to be in worse shape than the other buildings in the area. He could also see broken windows and large claw marks on the surrounding building's walls. I guess we found where Yumiko might have been killed. Naruto commented and started looking around for anything useful on what killed her. He would have taken a picture, but he was pretty sure that Gaudo investigated the area thoroughly as a spirit. An hour into helping Naruto and Kishina in their search for clues, Ino decided to enter Yumiko's home, after remembering that this was the street where she lived. Ino wondered if Yumiko even got far from her home before whatever killed her so brutally. After entering the house with Naruto, Kishina standing guard outside the abandoned home, the pair started to look into why a demon would attack her family, and her so specifically, and not wreak other havoc on other people. It was almost as if they were targeted by this demon. It seemed to Naruto that there weren't many possessions in the home, since there wasn't much in the way of furniture. The way that Gaudo elaborated on the subject of the dark world of towns, it seemed that only small things, like photos and books were absent when a dark world was formed. Yumiko's home was rather empty. When they reached Yumiko's room, they found something rather peculiar. There was an open tome on the floor, and what looked like several drawings of runes on the carpet floor of her room was still visible. It looked pretty recent as well as carefully drawn. This is one strange room Naruto muttered to himself as he picked up the open time. He glanced at the page that it was on and he was shocked. The picture was one of that humanoid monster that chased him on the first day he became a devil summoner. He read the text on the bottom of the picture ghoul, it read. So the monster that killed Yumiko was probably a ghoul, Naruto concluded. He had to wonder though, what were the drawings on the floor though? If he was any sort of genius, he would have to say that it was a complex summoning seal. Yumiko didn't seem to be the genius summoner type, but the array was there, and it raises some questions about Yumiko's life outside the academy. Hey look at this. This diary is glowing. Ino said from a nearby drawer in the room. Naruto peered closer to where Ino was looking and she was right. There was a faintly glowing diary inside the drawer. It looked normal and he felt nothing malicious out of it, so he picked it up. He tried opening it, but it seemed to be glued shut and wouldn't open. However, when Ino tried to open it, the diary opened easily. After dismissing it as something only Ino could do at this point, she started reading a page from the diary. Month I, day XXIV. Dear diary, my parents are fighting again. Mother is trying to find sources of money to pay for dad's debts. She had to use Hokage-sama's stipend for my school supplies. I hope that sensei doesn't recognize that I've been using two-year-old kunai and shuriken. I bought a really old book today. I've found so many strange pictures on it, but I've found something strange on it, it's a circle pattern. Ino frowned at the entry, but she continued reading the next page. Month I, day XXV. I've drawn the seal, but I'm having strange voices in my head. My mother was recoiling from the fight from yesterday father struck her. I'm scared, he never struck her before. Now Ino was getting a bit scared, this diary seemed to be recording her final days. She flipped to the last entry, which was the day she died. Month 2, Day 2. The voices in my head they told me to summon Ghoul Sama Ghoul Sama. What is happening to me? My head hurt so much I thought I saw the seal glow last night. 
My parents are quiet too, I feel that something bad is going to happen, there is nothing else what happened, Yumiko. Ino asked herself. Naruto shook his head and pocketed the tome and diary. He took a photo of the seal with a portable camera that Gato provided. It looked old, but it seemed to be more modern than those tripod cameras he saw on sale in the shopping district in Konoha. I don't think there's anything else let's go, an explosion rumbled through the house suddenly. Naruto panicked, Kishina. Rushing outside, Naruto was shocked to see Kishina doing a dogfight with a high jumping creature, and it was all very fast. Kishina rapidly chanted several spells and threw them in rapid succession to her opponent. However, the demon didn't even seem to flinch at the attacks and struck with his claws at Kishina with frightening speed. Naruto could only stare in horror as the creature just went through a shocked Kishina. Her side was slashed so cleanly that her blood didn't spill out until a clear five seconds later. Her moan of pain was silent as she fell from the sky, her wings suddenly stopped supporting her flight. Kishina. Naruto shouted her partner's name as he rushed toward her falling body. Ino's eyes widened as the angel was falling so quickly, her blood just flowing from her wound so rapidly. Naruto got to her in time just as she was about to hit the floor, she landed in his arms instead. Naruto didn't know what to do, her blood was just flowing too quickly. No Kashina Naruto could only plead as Kashina's lips started to turn blue. She was only moaning as her wound started to get a green tinge. Ino could only tear up as the angel situation got worse and worse. Her eyes widened as the shadowy opponent growled and started to run toward Naruto, who was worried about his partner's fate. Naruto. Ino screamed out as the creature swiped at Naruto's back. However, Naruto swiped at the claw with his sword with such precision and speed that it seemed unreal. The monster's claw was wiped clean off and it howled in pain as it backed away from Naruto. However, Naruto didn't seem to be himself, and Ino saw why. Kishina wasn't breathing. As Ino rushed toward her side, she saw Naruto become extremely angry. She actually saw a red aura envelop Naruto as he growled almost animal-like. He didn't seem to care that he was, excluding an aura of pressure that seemed to surpass what Naruto described as even Ino felt the heavy aura of death. As Ino looked over Kishina's body, she could only panic as the blood stopped flowing, but Kishina wasn't responding to her calls. Ino started to cry in sorrow, how could something so cruel take something as holy as an angel? They weren't hurting anyone. This wasn't fair. Ino's eyes widened even more as she thought back to when she attended a funeral for someone in her clan. Her cousin's face of agony as he stood there unwavering at the service. He was probably thinking that it wasn't fair that his father had died so suddenly. She wasn't related to this angel, how could anyone be? However, her short stay with her made a deep impact inside her soul. It must have been especially hard on Naruto, who has been together for far longer than her. It was so heartbreaking. The battle at hand prevented her from thinking down that train of thought any further though. Naruto roared in primal rage as he swung his sword with both rapid succession and accurate precision. The demon had no chance to defend itself as it took the blows fully. When Naruto had enough of it swinging, he began his finishing move. Launching the demon up into the air, the moonlight showed the demon's form for what it was. It was the ghoul from the book. Naruto growled as he skipped the seals for his bunshin and instead swung by himself through the skull first. He landed on the floor but instantly rocketed to swing back up the ghoul's corpse. He kicked off from the corpse to hit one of the walls of the street's buildings. He repeated this with frightening skill that he actually carved nine deep lines on the fading ghoul's corpse. However, before letting it die normally, Naruto used this red aura to jump a bit higher than the ghoul to charge his axe sword with the red energy, giving the blade a blood red edge. He threw the axe sword like a giant tomahawk at the body and actually shattered it into nine bloody pieces. The axe sword landed in a foot crater after going through the demon's body. Ino couldn't do anything but watch helplessly as Naruto's red aura didn't fade after killing that monster. She could only do one thing that would protect her as Naruto's wild look stared at her and started growling at her as a warning to get away. Desperate, Ino started her seal sequence as Naruto started to stalk her in Kishina, his nails growing into claws and acting like the demon he just destroyed. When she finished with the last seal, it was just in time as Naruto started to swing his claw-like arm at her. Shintenshin. Ino screamed out and her world faded. Baudo had a cold feeling, like his idiot apprentice had tapped into a power that was long thought to be sealed away, he only wished he was wrong, but knew his luck that just wasn't possible. Waking up to a sewer-like tunnel, Ino got up from the water-like substance and started to look around her new surroundings. She could see nothing but dank light and water, so her observations ended there. Seeing no choice, she walked forward and heard a piercing scream, as if it was, in pain and agony. Looking around very quickly, Ino could only hear the screams of pain, agony and anger. Running forward to where she believed the screams were coming from, Ino was shocked to see Kashina waiting for her. Kashina. You're alive. Ino asked, but the angel didn't answer. Her face was unusually solemn, a far cry from the mischievous and happy look that she sported often. 
She could only point at Ino and then at herself as she flew in a slow pace in a random direction. Ino got the impression that Kashina wanted her to follow. After following non-stop, Ino was led to a large room with a large gate in the distance. Her concern wasn't with that though, she found something much more pressing. Naruto was face down in the bubbling water. Quickly grabbing Naruto from the unusually hot water, he dragged a pain-ridden Naruto who was still moaning Kashina's name. Ino tried to tell him that Kashina was right here, but when she looked to where Kashina left her, she was nowhere to be seen. Kashina Kashina Naruto cried out. Ino noticed that with each second and with each rise of desperation that Naruto's voice showed, the bubbling water seemed to grow with more ferocity. Ino was probably imagining it, but she heard a dark chuckle in her mind as the bubbles seemed to take form. Dreading what the finished product of those bubbles were, she tried to shake Naruto from his stupor. Nothing worked except it was in an old film she watched with her dad when she was small, and it was the first thing that came to her mind. She slapped him hard. It worked as the bubbles fell apart and Naruto could only wake up and feel the sting of the slap. Naruto could only stiffen as Ino suddenly hugged him. He instinctively hugged back as their world went white. Ino gasped out as she woke in her own body again. She saw Naruto's prone form shake and stir as he groaned in pain. He woke up and Ino couldn't see the red aura surrounding him anymore. W where am I? Naruto groaned out, as if he had a huge headache from spinning around or drinking too much. However, his recent memories spurred him towards searching for his fallen partner. He wasn't prepared though, for a figure in a scientist's jet to be prodding her dead figure with awe. You. Get away from Kashina. Naruto shouted as he tried to ram the new figure from his friend's body. The figure, however, merely sidestepped and didn't even bother to watch Naruto slam into a wall. He was more interested in the fallen partner than Naruto's rather stupid tactic. W what are you doing to Kashina? Ino asked, shocked at the callous treatment of the fallen angel. The figure just smiled and picked up the body with one hand while motioning Ino with the other. Naruto could only groan as he tried to grab for his sword to attack this assailant, but could hiss and pain as the figure just stomped on his hand. Ino felt sorry for Naruto as she helped him up and tried to grab the abnormally heavy sword. Naruto however, grabbed the sword in one hand and put it in its scabbard, as he could do nothing without hurting Kashina in the process. Where are you taking us? Ino asked the figure as it stopped at an abandoned home, and she recognized the home as the place next door to her very own home. Don't worry now, I'll have this fabulous specimen back up and running to fight fit. The figure laughed insanely as he kicked in the doorway and disappeared down a set of stairs that Ino was sure wasn't there when she visited the building the other week. The blonde duo could only stare in amazement as they were led to a lab that only should have existed in the horror films of old. It was stocked up with various bubbling chemicals, and large generators of electricity were humming with intensity. Two well-charred cages stood in the back of the room with an operating table before it. The figure dumped Kashina's body rather roughly to the operating table and started to stretch the rubber gloves on its form. He started to laugh insanely, creeping out both Naruto and Ino. I'm guessing this is the first time you've seen a demon die, haven't you, apprentice devil summoner? Naruto's eyes widened. Who was he and how did he know that? Who are you? Naruto asked the figure as it connected several wires to Kashina's body. Naruto didn't like this bastard's treatment of his dead friend, and he certainly didn't like the figure putting wires on her body. By name the figure paused as it pulled a nearby switch next to the operating table. The large generators started to crackle and explode with overcharged electricity, and the sparks made clear on the figure's face. It was a pale white-skinned man with a large scientist's overcoat and large rubber gloves. A pair of goggles was on the man's eyes as he watched the energy from the generator pulse into Kashina's twitching body. Ino was mesmerized as the wounds that Kashina sported were closing up and healing as the electricity entered her body in large amounts. Naruto couldn't believe it either as the color of Kashina's skin was returning to her light peachy color. After a few more seconds, the scientist pulled back the switch and the electricity stopped pouring into her. It was almost instantaneous as Kashina gasped and sat up from the operating table. Both Naruto and Ino gasped, who was this man to bring back a soul from death to living once again? Is Victor, demon scientist extraordinaire? The man, Victor began laughing even more insanely as the generators sparked out excess electricity, making for a rather impressive introduction. Naruto and Kashina couldn't believe that the life and death of his contracted demons was, in the hands of this insane man it was, just too crazy to be real. Did he tell Gaudo this, young apprentice? Victor is coming to Kanoha soon. He said mysteriously as he charged up the generators once more. It's too far for you to go back the way you came. Fortunately, this little girl's house seems to have a point for exiting this world somewhere inside. Victor explained as he grabbed two live wires with ease and stuck them between two holes on a wooden box. The wooden box seemed to glow with intense energy before returning to a normal color for wood. Victor grinned as he pulled out the wires and grabbed the box. He tossed it to Ino, who caught it with both hands. 
She expected to get shocked, but felt no such thing to her wonder and amazement. Just use that box where the weak point is located and you'll be back in the real world. I think you've killed the rampant demon that was, causing so much trouble for the denizens here, and now they'll start to come back out to make this town a lively village again. I thank you from the bottom of my heart. Victor bowed as he escorted them out of his laboratory and into the demon world above. Almost instantly, the trio saw demons test the open roads outside and start chattering to their brethren to do the same. After entering Eno's home again, the two blondes started looking for the supposed weak point that would allow them to come back to the world that they knew. They tried the kitchen, bathroom and even Eno's parents' bedroom, but the box wouldn't even twitch. However, as they passed by Eno's room, the box started to glow faintly. As they entered Eno's bedroom, the box started to glow brighter and brighter until the box opened on its own. A large distortion appeared over Eno's bed, and both Naruto and Eno nodded. They both jumped into the distortion with Kishina close behind, as the world started to distort and expand before their eyes. Naruto landed first on Eno's bed and wasn't prepared for Eno's body to slam into his own in a compromising position, as his hands were on a blushing Eno's chest. As he said sorry and was about to push her off, Inoichi Yamanaka chose this particular moment to investigate the sudden thumping coming from his little missing flower's bedroom. The very awkward silence took precedence as both preteens watched the daughter's father steal his face into a mix of relief and anger, mostly anger. Ino Yamanaka. Her father shouted as Ino panicked and pushed off Naruto's chest, who went stock still. Even Kishina felt sorry for the girl as she was, looking at her enraged father. Both Kishina and Naruto felt cold dread as Inoichi's rage focused on both of them. Even if she was invisible to normal humans, Kishina felt that his anger was directed at her too. You. How dare you come here. You think you are being a man for taking my daughter's innocence. Inoichi raged and started to stalk toward a very scared Naruto. Outside the Yamanaka home, the civilians could only wonder why they were pleas for forgiveness, shouts of a young girl pleading for her father to stop, and a very angry Inoichi raging like never before against a boy who was in the wrong place at the wrong time. 